before I start with Steve then. Steve, um, what's been going on? Well, I think we should ask Mike. He's a Windows user. Is your computer working? My computer's working. Okay, yeah, well, my, my computer's working. But it seems, all of our computers here yeah, are working. Yeah, all our computers are working. <laughs> um, even our Windows machines are working. And I think that's, that's the place to start. There is no problem with Microsoft. There is no problem with Windows. But a lot of Windows machines on Friday seem to crash and cause a lot of problems. So what exactly happened? So loads and loads of machines you know, around the world started blue screening. Now blue screening, for those of you that have never come across it, you're very lucky, but it's basically when your machine has an error that it cannot recover from, and in Windows, that manifests itself as essentially a blue screen that says sorry, and there's actually a frowny face emoticon these days, which I don't think is strictly necessary. The way your computer works, in layman's terms, is that you have what's called the operating system, which is the software which manages everything running on your computer. One way to think about it, if you imagine the difference between a, a house and a hotel, if you own a house, you can decide how to use the rooms, what color to paint the walls. But if that house becomes a hotel, you might give people the option to change the air conditioning temperature, but you wouldn't let them fit air conditioning into their room without permission from the building owner. And it's a bit the same with the computer. The operating system is a bit like the people who run the hotel in that it's controlling all the resources for the system. So if Microsoft Word crashes, these days it's not gonna take down your computer because the operating system has set it up in such a way that it can access resources that have been assigned to it. If it crashes, the operating system can detect it, clean that up, and everything else continues hunky-dory. The difference is, and when you get a blue screen, is what happens if the operating system crashes? At that point, the thing that's in charge of controlling everything has gone wrong, is corrupted, and can no longer run and so there's pretty much no option at that point other than to halt the machine and say, ah, something's gone wrong and let the user reboot and restart yep. things. And actually, um, Windows also has protection mechanisms. Like, so it has something called kernel patch protection. Yep. So if something is messing around in the kernel, Windows will detect this and immediately blue screen as a sort of safety mechanism, yep. right? So there's lots of reasons that Windows might blue screen. Now in this case, the blue screen was caused at least in part by some software called CrowdStrike. Now CrowdStrike is what we call endpoint detection and, uh, and response software. In, and in, you know, Oversimplifying, it's essentially a fancy antivirus, right? But since about 2010, standard antivirus systems have become more network-based. They've become much more about what people are doing on systems rather than what exact software is running. So imagine you're a big company, let's say you're the University of Nottingham. What you might do is install software like this on all of your endpoints, which is your just general machines around your, uh, your buildings. And then they collect data on what people are doing, what's happening on those machines. And that data goes into some cloud server or some central server that processes it and uses things like machine learning to say, yeah, okay, I think, this, yeah, I think there's something suspicious over here. And the idea is that you're not waiting for a ransomware to spread across your network at which point you panic. You're, this thing is bringing in data that goes, there's something going on over here. You should just cut that bit of the network off right now and then we can see what's going on. And this kind of sort of immediate response. It's a good idea, right? Because yeah. you've got very many machines on a, on a network and you can't look at all the machines all the time. You haven't got the um, person People. power to yeah. do this, right? Yeah. And so what do you do? Well, you, you, you sort of grab all this data in and then you use big processes to work out what's going on. And it's worth pointing out, this is not something that you just do on Windows. Um, CrowdStrike runs on Mac, it runs on Linux, and there's yeah. other companies yeah. available that do this as well. And they're just reporting data about what's happening on the system. Now, as we said, what happens on the system is controlled by the operating system and your program will ask the operating system to do something on your behalf. Now for this software to work, it needs to be able to see what each program is doing. And so effectively it has to embed itself within the operating system. It has to become an extra janitor in a hotel, for example. So it's got like the passkey for all the rooms. It's and got the passkey for yeah. every room. It can see every request going through the concierge desk uh, and so on to drag the analogy beyond stretching point. And so actually in Windows there's a there's a kind of distinction between what we call user level drivers, for example, and kernel level drivers. And so software that's running at user level, it's pretty safe, right? Yep. You can balk up as much as you want on that piece of software. And generally speaking, the operating system will shrug that off, bring, bring down the process and move on. But if you're in the kernel, you can do serious damage very, very quickly. And so when you're writing kernel level code, you have to be extra, extra careful, right? And I'm, you know, I'm sure- Should be extra, extra You should be extra, extra careful. And what's happened here, is an update has gone out, which has caused an unrecoverable error you know, in kernel level code, which means that Windows hasn't been able to respond yeah. to that. And it's worth 
pointing out here is that this wasn't an update to the kernel level driver, the bit of code that's managing this for CrowdStrike, what's called their Falcon sensor, which is sitting monitoring it. It was an update to the definitions of what it's looking for. So there was a new threat using Windows node pipes, which are part of the operating system, and they'd updated the definitions for that, and they'd sent that out. It's got onto the systems, and then when the drivers try to load that on hundreds of millions of systems, it's just gone completely haywire and crashed. And is that a routine update that happens once a week or? You'll get updates as threats yeah. develop, you will need to update what you're looking for. For example, if you suddenly realize that people are using a new part of Windows you hadn't been checking for before, for some sort of malicious attack, you're gonna to want to report on that back to the central thing so you can say, hey, we created these named pipes um, in this case. Um, we Here's the details about what's going on. This is odd, this is routine, how they use and so on. An update to a piece of software that ran in, in, you know, in kernel space, yep. crashed Windows, and that made it very difficult to recover from. Because usually, if you can boot into Windows, you can delete whatever the offending yep. file is, or you can uninstall that software and reinstall a re previous version, or something like this. You can't do that if the machine won't run. Yep. Right? And so basically, a lot of systems that we depend on for things like flight booking, doctor's appointments, didn't run that day. Yeah. And then you have a, you know, a huge, huge problem. All the train services. Yeah, right? and this is perhaps an interesting thing is that people at home are probably thinking, well, my PC is fine. Why didn't mine crash? And this is because this is software specifically targeted at big enterprises, the NHS in the UK, the universities, banks, railway stations, those sort of things who need their IT teams to be able to monitor huge fleets of computer systems yeah. remotely. They're not the sort of antivirus that you'll run at home where you'll just be running Microsoft Defender. Although there's nothing that would stop the same thing happening with them. This isn't something that's unique to CrowdStrike, although they may have implemented something badly, we don't know. Um, anything that ends up running in kernel mode has the potential, if it goes wrong, yep. to cause these problems. And, and, it, and, it, and it also it draws attention to this kind of interconnected nature of what computer systems are nowadays, right? It's all very well me saying, well, I don't run this software, so I'm impervious to this attack. We build our computers on so many servers and other, other systems that we depend on that once you take out specific machines from across these, even if it's not that many machines, you can have an absolutely massive impact. You've mentioned CrowdStrike, but um, I've seen a lot of people blaming Microsoft. And you know, you mentioned before this could be on other operating systems. Why, why was Microsoft so badly hit by this? Uh, Microsoft was so badly hit because it was a specific bug that affected Microsoft yeah. machines and caused it to crash. And there's a lot of Microsoft Windows yeah. machines out in there. I mean, th the thing to point out is that Microsoft tried to solve this, but were told they can't do that. What they wanted to do was say, okay, antivirus software has to use a specific API to get this information, which means it doesn't have to run in kernel mode. That's a good idea, as we can see now, and is actually what people like Apple have done on macOS and iOS and so on, and they were told this would be a monopolistic practice. The antivirus vendors were like, we can't write our software if you do this. Maybe that would have been a good idea in hindsight. So that isn't thing, something as a result of this. This was something. This was, this was quite a while ago. So, yeah. you know, so for many years, there's been a sort of push war between the operating system vendors who want total control over their system so they can make it safer, but also it's easier to do that. Yeah. And other vendors who want to sell extra products like antivirus or endpoint response and so on or and so just forth. Graphics card drivers, yeah. or and so there is always going to be this trade off, but ultimately, you always have some software running on a machine that is not under the control of the operating system vendor but running in a privileged mode. Yeah. And this is true of all operating systems, so it would be very naive to think that this couldn't happen on Mac or it couldn't happen on Linux. And actually, there was an example with CrowdStrike again on Debian and Rocky Linux, I think, earlier in the year. Yeah, so uh, th things. these things happen. So, you know, people are saying, Oh, Microsoft should do this to fix it, Microsoft should do this. Actually, it's very, very difficult to fix, short of just blocking all these companies from running anything, and then you get in huge trouble, right? Yeah. And, and people wouldn't accept that either. So, I think that the better way to think about it is how do we mitigate potential issues when a number of PCs or a yeah. number of machines go down, then they can let's find a way to make them never go down, which doesn't yeah. seem very practical. And I mean, one way you could do that is what Google have done with the Chromebooks. So when a Chromebook updates, the disk inside it is partitioned in a certain way in that you have partitions with the data and then you have two partitions which contain the operating system. You're running in partition A, let's call it, and you apply the update and it updates partition B and then boots into partition B. Now, if that fails, it can reboot onto partition A and get your computer back into a situation where it's working. If Microsoft Windows had taken a similar approach, the update would have been applied, the system wouldn't have rebooted, and it could have rebooted to the previous version. Mm. 
The problem with that is that the way that these operating systems have sort of evolved or grown over time means that that would be a very major change which would break a lot of compatibility. And one of the things that perhaps differentiates Windows from Apple's approach to writing an operating system is that Apple's quite willing to, to break compatibility and say, we're going to make this change because there's reasons, often good reasons, although people don't necessarily like them at the time. Whereas Microsoft says, no, we're going to bend over backwards to make sure that that piece of software you had written in 1993 that is critical for running your nuclear power station, your railway station, whatever it is, will still run on the latest version of Windows 12 when you install it next year or whatever it is, you'll do so that. A lot of people spoke about this as, as the biggest attack ever, right? Now, I don't know numerically. Whether it's not it, an attack for start. Well, well, no, yeah, sorry, the biggest, yeah, the biggest security incident, the biggest PC incident, the biggest, Cock -up. yeah, the biggest mess <laughs> ever. And that might be the case in terms of a number of affected machines or a number of affected people. Um, but I would also note that it could have been a lot worse, yeah. right? This was a genuine mistake from a company yeah. that caused a genuine mistake of a problem. If they had been malicious, they could have done so much more damage, right? They could have started deleting files, they could have installed ransomware on all yeah. these machines instead. And then you would, we're coming at this now only a few days after, and most of the machines are back up because you can delete uh, this file. Okay. I, Some machines are back up. I think it's going to, I mean, that's actually the problem is that to fix this, you've got to boot the machine in safe mode, you've got to delete the offending channel update so the machine can reboot up and collect the update. That means physical access at the machine with someone who knows what they are doing where a lot of these machines with people working remotely are not necessarily near IT support. Yeah. I mean, famously, when, when Facebook's um, DNS issues arise, yeah. they couldn't get into the building yeah, to fix the machines the door, because, because they were also controlled by the same system. Yeah, right? so, but I mean, you know, had this company been like a state actor who'd um, acted maliciously, they could have encrypted a bunch of files on these machines and it would have taken, they would have had to essentially rebuild these machines from scratch, yeah. right? Or, and, and that would have been a, a major, major incident. And just one question then, and you mentioned endpoint, this is endpoints, this is generally not servers, so they are at least accessible or what? Well, yes, except that I think this is quite routinely yeah, installed on servers, servers as well. well. Like, I mean, there are people installing this stuff on their domain controllers for networks, right? I mean, and endpoint so, as in not the middle of your network, Yeah. not the switches. Or, or, or maybe not the, not the machine that's incorporating all this data specifically, right? Yeah. So, it, you know, you could think of it as as the endpoint is not the one, let's say, analyzing all the logs, checking all the data, that's going off and being checked elsewhere. Yeah. But if it's installed on a domain controller, yeah. no one can log into your network, yeah. right? Because that's the one that does the login, that's the one that manages all the users. So depending on where this was installed and, to how, and how many systems it was installed on, you could have had a slight headache or a very bad day, depending on, on which I mean, it could be a really was. bad day yeah. or month. Yeah, and you get interested, I mean, I, I heard on Twitter, sorry, Elon, um, there have one company who was having to do this on Amazon's EC2 network and of course everyone's doing it which means the latency on accessing yeah. backups on rebooting systems because everyone's accessing the disks because everyone's doing the same thing suddenly shoots through the roof. There's been a lot of talk un unrelated to computers there's been a lot of talk you know in, in the current sort of political climate about things like supply chains right chip yeah. manufacturers right should all chips be manufactured in, in one country or should all countries be able yeah. to produce chips and, and I think the same is also true of control over systems and operating systems, right? If you put everything onto the cloud and the cloud isn't there, you've got nothing. Yeah. There's just some things to think about for companies and for individuals about to what extent do we spread everything around and, and leave ourselves at the risk of, of, of not being able to run anything when specific machines go down that we depend on. And it's probably worth also thinking about backup stretches. If this has been the university, okay, we don't run CrowdStrike, but we do run equivalent software on our machines. And we had an exam, for example, we have online exams that was due to happen that day. That would be chaos. And it might actually be worth us thinking as a university, well, what would be our backup plan? A bit like the pandemic and how everyone went, well, we were totally unprepared. I mean, how, how prepared can you be for a global virus, right? And in some sense, this is kind of a similar concept. We can prepare all we want, but ultimately we also have to expect that at some point, a lot of machines are going to go down, the DNS system is going to go down, something's going to go wrong and suddenly none of your PCs work anymore for a day. And then you just have to think about what you might do. And, and as I said uh, online, I think you should just go outside and enjoy the sunshine. And run it. Right, so we should see the message hello computer file pop up. Performance. So it's getting the data of various things and we see here better. hello computer and file. Be great. And remember that if we ended up up here, we have something that could take any image and tell you exactly what's in it under any circumstance.